2023, and welcome to the first edition of the Friday Show for the year. I'm Ray Pollack, publisher of the Pollock Report, joined by Joe Nevels, Bloodstock editor, and our guest this week is Andrew Champagne, handicapper for the Pink Sheet, published by the Saratogian in upstate New York all summer. Uh, welcome, guys. We're, we're presented uh, by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association, which has, uh, thank you, Andrew, which has a stallion season auction coming up. Joe, what's going on there? Big deal with the stallion season auction. Get your plans booked for 2023 breeding season, January 15th through January 22nd. We've got seasons from stallion standing in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Arizona, uh, Maryland, New York. Uh, if you're breeding, you know, if you're a serious breeder, you're looking at the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association stallion auction. They got the stallion for you. Yeah, I noticed uh, in reviewing the grade one races for 20, uh, 2022, no state outside of Kentucky had more than one grade one winner other than Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Breds uh, won two grade one races. Caravelle won the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint and just one time won the Madison. So Pennsylvania is moving up in the breeding world. One time. And that's at thoroughlybred.com. Um. Hey, the Eclipse Award voting closed this week. Joe, you wrote about your choices. Uh, Andrew, you're a voter. I am not a voter. As Groucho Marx said, I would not join a club that would have me as a member. So I'm not a member of the National Turf Riders and Broadcasters. So I don't have a vote. But let's talk about all of the controversies in, in this year's voting. There really aren't any, are there? There's a couple, maybe. Uh, Three-year-old male division. I guess that's the most hotly debated division. Uh, Joe, where did you go with this one? Well, this is a long journey. Uh, if you read my Making Claims column on the Pollock Report website, you went along on this journey with me. But when I first received the ballot in my hand, I was voting with my heart. And my heart said Epicenter. He ran in the biggest races this year. He didn't throw a clunker until his body literally gave out on him in the Breeders' Cup Classic. I'm not going to count that against him. Uh, he probably should have won at least one of the two Triple Crown races that he ran in this year, the Derby and the Preakness, ran good seconds in both of them, ran into a miracle in the Derby, and just got a lousy trip in the Preakness. He's he's a good horse. He I thought he was consistently the best horse of the three-year-old season. And then Taba went and won the Malibu. And then I had to start thinking about voting with my head because all of a sudden he had three grade ones and Epicenter only had one. So I got granular on this. I went into minute details. I looked at every graded stakes winning horse that each horse Epicenter and Taba beat over the course of the year. I looked at strength of schedule and Epicenter won out for me. Uh, he beat 28 graded stakes winners this year compared to Tabus 24 and beat 14 grade one winners to Tabus 12. Um, so that's what went out for me. Sometimes when the heart and the head agree, you just go to the hard numbers and you let the Excel sheets figure it out. So that's all the time we have this week. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching again. That was totallybred.com for the Pennsylvania Stallion yeah. Auction. Some people Thank will say I have never sounded you. better, ever. <laughs> Andrew, what, what, where did you go with the three-year-old vote? Sure. So the thing that confused me a little bit after the Breeders' Cup Classic when there was momentum for several different horses to apparently come up and snatch champion three-year-old male out of Epicenter's grasp is do seconds in grade one races, major grade one races, and grade two wins suddenly not matter at all? Epicenter wins the Jim Dandy impressively, wins the Louisiana Derby and the Risen Star impressively. Second to that miracle in the Kentucky Derby. Second with a lousy break in the Preakness. Suddenly I'm supposed to think that doesn't matter? No. Epicenter is champion three-year-old male for me. It hadn't been particularly close. And here's some food for thought here. To the people that tried to say Rich Strike would have been champion three-year-old male if he'd won the Clark because then he would have beaten older horses. Modern games beat older horses twice. Just saying. I'm, I'm glad you brought up modern games. There are some people who think that he should be the champion. Uh, only a turf horse. And, uh, you know, he, he's a European-based horse. There is some precedent going back quite a ways. But all along, uh, won three grade ones in North America on route to being horse of the year 
way back in the 80s, I think it was, or late 70s. And, uh, you know, there's some, there's some support for modern games. What do you guys think on, on voting for a turf horse for three-year-old champion? Listen, if the field warrants it and there isn't a clear-cut winner amongst the traditional, you know, three-year-old candidates that we think of the triple crown style horses, the classic style horses, then yes, absolutely. I've done that in the past in other divisions. And this is a field where beyond Epicenter and Taba, you got to think kind of hard about it before you find that third horse. And I thought Modern Games' achievements this year were definitely worth warranting. I put him second on my ballot. Me too. And he'll get some first place votes, no doubt. Oh, definitely. Some, yeah. I I thought about putting him up first. Uh, If, you know, things had shaken out differently for a few other horses and some other ways, I don't fault anyone for putting modern games on top. I'll just leave it at that. I think it's a cop-out. I think there's a turf division. He belongs in that division. And, you know, people that basically are voting for him first are just wasting their vote. Um, And and as, you know, Andrew, you make a good point about, the, the 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 seconds in a grade one like the Kentucky Derby being meaningful. I look at three grade ones that table one, and nothing against him or the the, the races, but you know, short field the Sanity Derby. Uh, the Pennsylvania Derby is late in the year, and I don't think there should be three year old restrictive races. Really, I think that the Travers should be the last one. So you know, he won that, and then December twenty sixth when. Three-year-olds should be racing against older horses. He wins not a great renewal of the Malibu. So all grade ones are not you know, created equally as, as far as I'm concerned. What's another division that uh, you guys had to really kind of ponder over? Well, you mentioned modern games and the turf division and whether, you know, who, who deserves to win something like that? And for me, and Andrew can probably back me up on this, once you get beyond modern games, nobody deserved to win that division. It was not good this year. The entire season, the major turf races in North America were largely spent with Charlie Appleby coming overseas and picking up our best by, on the turf by the ankles and shaking them down for their lunch money. That happened time after time. Modern games was the best at it this year. Won a Breeders' Cup race, won the Woodbine Mile, and beyond that, if I could have put Mickey Mouse for the next two horses in that slot and not lost my NTWAB Eclipse vote, I'd have done it. It was not a good division. So here's a fun trivia question for the two of you. This year, in the materials that we received for Eclipse Award voting, there were three North American-based turf horses that won two grade one races all year. Can you name them? No. So... Two of them were on my ballot below because I couldn't put Mickey Mouse. One was Casa Creed. Yep. And the other one was Santine. Yep. Who was the other one? Count again, who did not run after the spring. He won two grade ones at Santa Anita. I believe it was the Kilroe and the Shoemaker Mile. It was a bad division this year. And credit to Charlie Appleby for sending over his horses to win a lot of races and a lot of money. And you mentioned, Joe, taking our best horses and shaking them up and down for lunch money. That's impressive because he's not a big guy. He must be very strong. Very strong. Very strong trainer and very successful at what he does. Yeah. In that division, you know, for, for, for those who like to do things like vote for modern games as best three-year-old, why not put a steeplechase horse into the turf division? Steeplechase races are run on turf, technically, correct? I've heard worse arguments, honestly. So I know that you both are big aficionados of the steeplechase game. What? Who did you? Who did, so who did I'm going to jump in first because I was born and raised in upstate New York. Saratoga has two grade one steeplechase races. I have voted for steeplechase in the past. I was there as a kid when a horse named Nine Pins won the New York Turf Riders Cup at age 13. I'm a proponent of steeplechase racing. I like steeplechase racing. Having said that, this year's scenario, not ideal for someone that's not embedded in the game. You have a horse like Snap Decision who carried about 9,000 pounds to victory in the Jonathan Shepard at Saratoga. Joe, we were both there for that. We were. That was incredibly impressive. Then he tails off near the end of the year. He's second beaten nine lengths down at Belmont, and he did not run well in the last race of the year. You get the horse that beat him by nine lengths at 40-some-odd to one. He came back and ran second in the last grade one of the year, 
behind a horse that dusted both of them by 11 lengths. I'm going to leave that to people who know far more about it than I do. It's not laziness. It's respect for the process. Precisely. And that's the reason why I abstained from my ballot. And by because I abstained from my ballot, by popular demand from Steeplechase Twitter, I am coming to you hat in hand and saying that I am renouncing my Eclipse Award ballot until I receive it in 20, in December 2023, at which point I'll be voting next year as usual. I'm going to talk while they're everybody going, throws things at the screen here. <laughs> they're going to award the trophy whether I vote in the category or not. It's a respect thing. I don't want to vote for the wrong horse because then steeplechase Twitter is going to be mad at me no matter what. They're going to say I didn't follow the product hard enough. I didn't vote for the right horse. And listen. Because I just because I don't vote for the category doesn't mean this isn't a vote for it not being awarded. Period. I think it's fine. Give them a seat at the table. I think there should be a champion steeplechase trainer award, steeplechase owner award. Give them what they want. Like I'm not saying I'm not saying there shouldn't be a steeplechase award. I'm I can come out now, right? Duck for a little longer. I'm almost done. I'm not saying that it shouldn't exist. I'm fine with it existing. I'm just saying I have no professional ties, obligations, anything to follow it beyond what I might see in a passing glance. And the trade-off for filling three boxes in a survey monkey form is not equal to the time that I would have to sink into, oh, just watching a few videos or, you know, learning the culture. It's a completely different culture from flat racing. It just is. And the people who are spending energy trying to tell me and other abstainers to like turn in your ballots Spend time celebrating your product. Celebrate the horses that are going to be nominated. Campaign for them. Tell me why Snap Decision should be the top steeplechase horse. Tell me why these horses are good. Explain to me what level a grade one is compared to other ones. What's the Kentucky Derby of steeplechase racing? No one's telling me that. They just want to tell me, get rid of your ballot. You know, you spent the whole year covering everything else because you didn't cover this one thing that has nothing to do with anything you do for your job. You should just lose your ballot. You should just you, you you're not taking this seriously. I am taking this more seriously than a lot of people who are actually voting for steeplechase. I'm done. Andrew, you can get up. You're done. Okay. Good, because my back hurts. So, the late Bill Leggett, who wrote for Sports Illustrated for many years, I think he grew up around Saratoga. He once gave me a great tip on handicapping steeplechase races. It didn't have anything to do with voting for the Eclipse Awards, but he said. Add up all the Roman numerals on the on the owner, the jockey, and the trainer. <laughs> and whichever horse has the most seconds and thirds and fourths in the name, not in the past performances, uh, that's the winner. And and that actually worked a few times. Listen, uh, if a if an operation can sustain generational talent, they're probably doing something right. All right. So we we've we've gone over who you guys like for the steeplechase horse. Um were there any were there any tough calls in the People Awards? You look at who the favorites are, and I have to say, Arad Ortiz again, uh, who you know he he didn't put anybody over the rail this year. That was last year, I believe, <laughs> but he's still fairly controversial uh, for his on track antics. He he's he's he rides very as Richard Migliori. He rides right on the line a lot of times, and sometimes he goes over the line on some things. Uh, in the trainer division, the leading trainer by money was Chad Brown. Not a great year off the track for Chad Brown uh, because of his arrest at Saratoga and subsequent guilty plea to a lesser charge. How do you how do you guys mix that into your voting? Andrew, you want to take this one or you want me to? Sure. So with regard to Arad Ortiz, uh, there's no doubt he is an excellent rider. As you've mentioned, he's aggressive, bordering on reckless. Some of that isn't necessarily his fault. And I liken it to a driver that's running late. If you're on a road where the speed limit is 55 and you know the cops aren't going to pull you over for going 80, what are you going to do? Stewards have to share some of the culpability in some of this because they have not effectively policed the way a Rod Ortiz Jr. and maybe some others as well. They have not effectively policed how they ride I can't punish Erod Ortiz Jr. for pushing it as such as the way that he did in the Eclipse Award voting. As far as trainer goes, Joe and I share the same opinion here, and I thought Joe phrased it perfectly in his column. So, Joe, take it away. 
the road to Eclipse Award glory does not go through the Saratoga Springs courthouse. Simple as that. Okay. Um, you know, for behavioral issues, for me leaving a person off a ballot, it tends to have to stick to something that either happened on the racetrack, involved horse racing, or je- otherwise makes the sport look bad, puts a ba- black eye on the sport, harms the sport's social license to operate. Mm. Last year, I could say that about Bob Baffert. His horses, his training, his he, himself, and his owners who supported him after the positive test didn't make my ballot. Last year, Arad Ortiz put a guy into the rail and got 30-day suspension as the ballots were in hand. I couldn't not take him off my ballot. This year, he was on, as Andrew said, you know, there's he didn't do anything illegal in the eyes of the stewards. Chad Brown was kind of a gray area. What happened with him happened did not happen on the racetrack, but happened to another mem- with another member of the racing community. I think it left a really black eye on the sport. Um, I think it gained some national attention to the sport that doesn't look good. It doesn't look good when the biggest trainer in the country ends up in the courthouse in the, in the morning of one of the biggest, most visible race meets in the country. Uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't put him on top. So I looked elsewhere and I went with Todd Pletcher. And I don't think it would look good for the industry to give that individual an award at the end of the year for which that happened. So wouldn't be the first time. Yeah. Um, one last question. The, the, you guys are members of the National Turf Riders and Broadcasters, which makes your votes public. The other two voting groups, the Daily Racing Forum and NTRA, which we're not even sure who that incorporates, the NTRA's group, um, they do not make their votes public. Should they be pub- made public or not? I think it puts you in an uncomfortable position in some ways. And, and on the other hand, I think there are some conflicts of interest in the NTRA group that are never really uh, you know, brought into the, the light uh, because you know, people, I think there are people that vote f- that are working for the Breeders' Cup. They have a conflict of interest. They want Breeders' Cup winners to be champions. So what do you think of the, the, the transparency that your group has and the, and the other groups do not have? I've always been of the mindset that no matter what moral stance I take on voting or not voting for someone, there's going to be someone in the NTRA block to disqualify me. I think they should all be made public. Completely agree. Transparency matters. Good enough. Well, listen, I appreciate your time. Uh, We'll see. I don't, like I said, there's not a lot of surprises in this year's voting. The the two-year-old divisions are pretty clear cut. I I, I think the three-year-old uh, divisions are pretty clear cut and there's a couple that maybe are a little more difficult but uh, those would be on the turf um, we want to thank the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association uh, tune into their stallion actually thank you for the props there Andrew and we will see you next week on the Friday show support award winning independent horse industry journalism and become a Pollock Report insider on Patreon For as little as $5 a month, insiders get access to exclusive Q&As with Pollock Report staff, insight behind our editorial process, exclusive opinions and on-site analysis, Pollock Report merch, and more. This is not a paywall. The website you know and love will always be the same. But if you want more, and you want to make our coverage even better, visit patreon.com slash Pollock Report and become a Pollock Report insider today.